Uh, welcome everybody. Again, thanks for, for joining us today, this session of Claims Corner. The topic is through the lens of an inspector. Um, so at, I like that, uh, that phrase. So we're excited to have uh, Knight Solutions here with us to discuss how the information, how information is obtained, observed, uh, documented through the lens of an inspector. Okay, so ladder assist folks, the technicians, there's a lot of, there's a lot asked of them. Okay, they're tasked with providing detailed information, documentation uh, to adjusters for their claims so that it can be resolved, obviously, uh, timely and accurately. Okay, today uh, we're going to have these folks, uh, Ron and, and James, talk about, uh, they're going to touch on difficulties surrounding uh, claims that involve hill, uh, how an inspection is performed specifically for hill, how hill damage is assessed, how it's documented, uh, the nuances between hill and wind, understanding the collateral damages, evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, materials, the pitch, wind direction uh, during that event, age and deterioration, the brittleness, the density of the hailstone, all of those things play vital roles in the understanding for these technicians of what hail damage is, what possibly is not hail damage, okay? Knowing, understanding that helps paint the picture for everyone involved, of course, for the adjuster as well. So I guess speakers today are Ryan Travis Knight and James Thompson. Uh, they're gonna elaborate on how they do this on a daily basis. So a little bit about them. Uh, Ryan Travis Knight, he is the division president for Knight Solutions. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration and management, he holds uh, six HAG designations, okay? He has uh, multiple industry certifications. He is also a licensed adjuster. He's got, he's got over 15 years in the industry. He's inspected over 8,000 properties in the field as a contractor, ladder assist, an adjuster, as a consultant, and even assisted on engineering inspections. Uh, James Thompson. He's also with us. Uh, he, he, he started working with Knight Solutions uh, in 2016, just kind of um, as a side gig, side hustle, just, just seeing what it was about. And he, he, he grew to, to love it. And now he's a full-time technician um, or he became a full-time technician in 2017. Now he's the sales and marketing director for the company. Uh, he also holds a bachelor's um, in business administration and management. Uh, he has two HAG certification and has more than 15 years of experience in the construction piece of it. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to James and um, Ryan, and we'll let you guys take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to be going through a report today that kind of outlines what hail damage looks like. And as ladder assist or claims technicians, even inspectors, we go out to a property and we're tasked by the insurance carriers to go out, gather information, correlate that information, and kind of tell the overall story to the, pro to the property adjusters or inside desk adjusters. They're going to review that information and they're going to be able to write a competitive or accurate estimate based off the information that, we, that they're receiving. Uh, to kind of go into a, just a little bit of background, it started truly as a ladder assist uh, company back in the day. And when you know the ladder assist was first kind of introduced to the industry, it was generally just a contract of going out and putting a ladder up against the property. As the industry kind of transitioned more into the future, more adjusters and, and the liabilities that were coming within the industry kind of stopped adjusters from traversing these 12-12s, two-story, three-story roofing systems, it started to be a thing where a ladder assist technician would go up and gather that documentation. Once again, as the industry carried for, further, um, it got to a point where it was completely a technician out there uh, on a virtual inspection, collaborating with an inside adjuster and redirecting that information back to them. It's big from our stance to make sure that the adjuster is the focal point of getting the information directly to them and that they are in direct communications with a policyholder and that they make all coverage determinations. So basically, we're out there to gather information and that's what we're gonna outline in this report today. 
and I'm gonna let James kind of go through the report, talk about things. And this was actually his report on a property inspection he inspected. James is our marketing director now, and he oversees um, all the stuff that we're doing as far as growth and pushing the company forward and new advancement in, in, in marketing ideas. So once again, James is going to be going through his report, kind of outline everything and break everything down so people can understand what it is we actually do from a ladder assist or inspector standpoint. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Julie, David, thank you guys so much for having us uh, on the Claims Corner podcast today. Um, so as, uh, as David already alluded to and Ryan as well, uh, ladder assist technicians were tasked with being stuck smack in the middle between policyholders, homeowners, and the adjusters and making sure that we document the situation very well, paint the picture, so to speak. That's what we commonly refer to it as. And it's not, uh, it's not the easiest of tasks. Uh, painting the picture very well for an adjuster to just look at still photos and, and make a coverage determination about somebody's largest investment of their lifetime about their home. A uh, very difficult situation to be in at times and uh, a lot of knowledge, experience, uh, relationship building is very important in this industry as well. Having a good relationship with the adjusters that we service day in and day out all plays a, a very vital role in what we do as ladder assist technicians. So let's jump right into it. I'm gonna start screen sharing and we're gonna jump right into this report. The first document here, this is just a synopsis uh, of our findings, some uh, background information. This is our scope sheet where we record text information about our findings during an inspection. We're gonna jump right into the photos and start talking about uh, what a ladder assist does and, and how we go about obtaining information. Um, so this particular inspection, a little bit of background information here. Um, our, our main two services, ladder assisting, which for us entails that we actually meet an adjuster on site to do an inspection and direct inspections, which means that a ladder assist technician uh, travels to the property performs an inspection autonomously without the adjuster being present. So this particular inspection here, this was a ladder assist. The adjuster was on site. We knew going into this that this was gonna be a monster inspection. So we've got a, we've got a farm uh, uh, policy here, farmhouse. And there was a bunch of detached structures on this, poly, or this uh, property as well that needed inspection. So the adjuster had specifically requested me for this inspection because he knew it was gonna be a very difficult one, a very lengthy monster inspection. So the adjuster was on site. Um, normally, if we were at this property by ourselves without the adjuster present, we would definitely be honing in on possible collateral damages to the exterior elevations. And of course, providing that, uh, that documentation, that evidence, collateral evidence to support calling hail damage on this property. With the adjuster being present, um, he kind of directed me to focus more on the roofing system and let him cover the exterior elevations at his own discretion. So of course I was I was following his direction. You see my notes here it says uh, this is just an overview of the elevation, but the elevation was scoped uh, on a close-up basis by the adjuster himself. I, I'm just taking really good overviews of this property because after the inspection is completed, as a technician, I'm also responsible for uh, prefer producing a sketch of this property as well. So these overviews are not just for the adjuster's benefit, but also for my benefit when I need to produce a sketch later on. <clears throat> Documenting the materials of the property. Of course, uh, of course, this is extremely important for an adjuster's ability to write an accurate estimate. How many layers, was it a drip edge? Um, did it have a starter strip? Did it have felt visible? There was drip edge on the rakes as well. Shingle type, using our gauge there. Um, Eve overhang, if ice and water possibly comes into play. This particular area of the country here in uh, central Kentucky, uh, not something that you see very often just because of the area of the country that we're in. They travel farther north, you're gonna see ice and water a lot more um, and document it accordingly. Flashing here, documenting that so the adjuster can account for that in his estimate. Obviously recording the pitch values on different slopes. And then going directly into a roofing system overview. Again, this is for my benefit, just as much as the adjuster for sketching purposes, showing the overall layout of the roofing system before I actually get into 
uh, specific details, damage counts, things of that nature. This is a photo that I absolutely always like to incorporate in, in just about every inspection that I perform. Um, agent deterioration of ridge caps. And uh, I call it agent deterioration, but really I'm documenting uh, damage by birds as well. This gives me a, a better understanding of the overall age of a roofing system, because if we don't have specific information from the homeowner as to exactly how that roofing system is, or if the adjuster slash carrier doesn't have very specific details surrounding the age of that roofing system, I'm trying to gather as much information to make the best guesstimate possible about the overall age and condition of this roofing system. So birds can be very disruptive to roofing systems and they, they definitely like to hang out on the ridges, um, usually right at the end of a ridge. Bird droppings can turn acidic. They can actually do quite a lot of damage to ridge caps. And then of course, staying focused on the ridge caps for the next couple of photos, I was immediately seeing some hail damage to these uh, ridge caps on this property. One of the very first things that I'm looking at, uh, ridge caps are uh, typically a little bit less supported than shingles in the open fields of a slope or facet. Um, so they would typically see hail damage um, easier or sooner than shingles in an open field. So definitely like to document that. That was a very large concave impression from a hailstone strike there. Um, I'm trying to take that picture at a very, very close range. I'm not trying to get too close so that you can't have any perspective at all, but definitely don't want to take that picture from two, three, four foot away either because you don't have enough quality as an adjuster to look at that photo and say, yes, I agree that that's hail damage. And then we did have some possible wind damage to another ridge cap that I observed there. Uh, again, in the beginning of my report, staying focused on the ridge cap, so I took a picture of that as well. Our appurtenances on the roofing system, definitely very important to note all this information again for the adjuster so that he can make a very, very accurate estimate if he's gonna write an estimate to replace his whole roofing system. And then of course, after we get a count of all the appurtenances, I'm taking some good photos to document whether there is storm related damage to these appurtenances or not. And so uh, onto the box vents here. So sometimes I would, um, I would chalk box vents, but if I'm able to see potential damage to these box vents without chalking them, if I can see it with the naked eye, I'm usually trying to, uh, take a picture without the chalk on there. And then this one right here, I did chalk this one just for uh, highlighting, drawing attention to these uh, indentations in this aluminum box vent for the adjuster. Collateral evidence, very important to note um, to, again, help paint the picture for the adjuster. If this had been a direct inspection situation where the adjuster wasn't present, um, let's say he was in an office building, you know, uh, three states away, right? He's, he's relying solely on still photos that I'm providing for him to make a determination, potentially about buying a $25,000, $30,000 roofing system. So documentation is paramount over everything. This one right here, I'm using my shingle gauge to provide a little bit of scale um, as to the size of the indentations and in that, in that aluminum box vent. And it's roughly uh, three quarters of an inch, maybe seven eighths of an inch size indentation. That would tell me that the hailstone that hit that is probably slightly larger than an inch. Um, the indentation usually represents about 75 to potentially 85% of the overall size of that hailstone. You want to talk about any, any frequency or the concave pressure itself. So for the audience, obviously, we're gonna have a bunch of adjusters watching this, property adjusters, flood adjusters, what have you. So from technicians, we're correlating information as well. And I just wanted to touch on the collateral for the box fan. And that's, that goes the same for your rain caps on the furnace stacks. But as technicians, we're not just looking at that impression. We're also looking at the overall frequency of collateral to that box fan. Do we have heavy frequency? Do we have multiple sizes? How deep are the concave impressions? And that gives you a general idea of how to correlate what the damages you're seeing to the shingles as well, and if that information adds up. But frequency plays a vital role. You can see there, James side angle shows pretty good frequency to that box fan. So as an inspector, I suspect that I'm going to be looking at decent frequency as far as hill falls, just depending on the condition of those shingles. And one more thing, 
and talk about age. And it's something we don't generally share uh, with a lot of people, but being that this is a, a good event today, we'll give it, we'll give to the audience. You guys can look at a stagnation region of a shingle and kind of gauge the age of that roof and assembly. If James uh, will take you to just a shingle quick overview to show you where that stagnation region is at. Here's, here's a good one. James, you'll highlight that stagnation region. Basically, you can, yeah, you can look at it, you can look at the where, because right, water runs over that area where there's a change in geometry. And that will erode or that will degrade that area, just like a waterfall hitting the side of a cliff. So if you look at that stagnation region where water traverses over top of that, you can gauge the age of that roofing assembly in increments of six to eight years. So if it's one sixteenth of an inch, I'm gonna say that's two to eight years old. Two sixteenths of an inch, I'm gonna say that's eight to 14 years old. Three sixteenths of an inch, that's 12 to 18 year old. And if you get to four sixteenths of an inch of wear, that's generally indicative of a 20 year plus system. That's not always 100% accurate, but if you start doing it, you'll find that it's relatively close if you don't really know the age of that roof in the center. But I'll let James the collateral. Those are just a, some tidbits, and I know we can be formal about this today and document this thing on how we look at it, but we just want to be able to give the audience, which is you know, experts, adjusters, part adjusters, the information that we look at from an inspector standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. All these all these pieces of information all add up to a, a detailed and thorough report. I kind of wish I had taken a slightly better photo of this uh, rain cap on top of that chimney. Um, looks like the way the light was hitting that, um, the impressions are not showing up really good, but I was absolutely observing hail damage to that rain cap. And so uh, another very, very important uh, piece of information for this particular roofing system right here and the storm and the damage we were observing on this property, the pitch of this roof. Um, so the, the two story sections of this roofing system, fairly steep at 10, 12. So even though I was seeing pretty, uh, pretty good collateral damage and consistency, um, the damage I was actually seeing to the shingles uh, was not of very, very high frequency. You see my damage count here on the front slope, which is facing east. That's also uh, a piece of information to be um, thought about in this process. Facing east, I believe the east was the uh, leeward side of the storm. Even though it, it, it appeared that the damage was kind of coming uh, straight down in, in most uh, areas, um, the leeward side of the storm probably gets the, the least amount of damage. Uh, the least amount of strikes with high kinetic energy that can actually produce damage on these laminate shingles. This is a blister. Um, there was no there was no concave impression here. That little bit of exposed fiberglass that we can see in that photo appeared to be very undisturbed. I believe this started as a blister uh, probably some years ago, of course, and then the weathering process takes over and the spot gets larger and more pronounced, uh, more visible to the naked eye, of course. Normal granule loss, that's just, uh, that's to be expected. Granule loss, uh, just a part of normal agent deterioration of a roofing system. Again, some more blistering, no concave impression. It definitely did not look like this was a, uh, a hail strike, like an object had struck the shingle in that particular area. Um, I'm highlighting this because I think it's very important to, to be able to discern between obviously what is what is uh, storm related damage and what is not on a roofing system and so even though my frequency was really low on this front test area that is a massive hailstone hit right there right on the edge of a uh, I believe that's a laminate portion of the shingle not the base mat but very concave impression the exposed bitumen in that area is uh is still pretty I'm not gonna say jet black uh, but still pretty black. Hasn't been oxidized, hasn't, hasn't gone through the weathering process for very long. That tells me as an inspector that the, uh, the damage is pretty fresh, pretty recent. Um, this one right here, um, I definitely felt like that was a hailstone strike. That one's a little bit larger. I'd say that one right there is probably uh, golf ball size, uh, pretty close to it. Now that might not be the overall average size of a hailstone striking this area, this property, but of course you definitely get some rogue stones you know, during a hail event. And of course, um, just because that one particular hailstone strike there 
is much larger than some of the other ones we, we see on the shingles on this roof, doesn't mean we, we absolutely rule it out. Absolutely, as an inspector, we understand that you get some rogue stones. Sometimes the sizes are gonna vary a little bit. This is a defect in the shingles here, probably, uh, probably some kind of defect stemming from the manufacturing process uh, doesn't look to be like normal age and deterioration. That's why we identify that as a spot defect rather than just normal granule loss, like what we're seeing here. Speed up a little bit. There's another very, very large hailstone strike on that front slope. Uh, spatter marks, the removal of oxidation. This also gives us very good insight into recent hail activity at the property. And me as an inspector, I'm definitely trying to highlight this information again, paint, painting the picture for the adjuster so they have as, as much of an understanding of what took place at this property as possible. Again, using my shingle gauge there to provide some scale for that spider mark. So even though, let me, let me go back to uh, this picture right here. I see lots of spider marks um, on this, uh, this slope, this east facing slope right here. Tells me the frequency was pretty high, but a lot of these stones right here striking this slope, they're, uh, they're glancing blows. They don't have the high kinetic energy like they're hitting that shingle from a straight on perspective. They're glancing blows. They're, they're taking some of the oxidation off of those shingles. They're leaving their mark behind, but not necessarily producing damage. Um, and then the following photos after this, even though this was definitely geared towards a hail inspection, there wasn't any wind damage reported. Me as an inspector, I'm absolutely still trying to provide really good overviews of the entire slopes for continuity, just to say, hey, I did not observe any wind damage on this roof as I was performing an inspection. So all these subsequent photos after my front damage count, these are all front facing slopes. I'm just trying to show there wasn't any hail damage, trying to provide a really good sample uh, condition photo here, saying that the overall condition is fair slash good. Fair slash good may be a little bit of a reach. The granule loss was, was very mild, maybe moderate in some places, but overall condition was still pretty decent on this roofing system. And then into our next damage count <clears throat> on this north facing slope, uh, the frequency did go up a little bit. Again, spatter marks on these, uh, these uh, discolored oxidized shingles. Again, showing the scale for reference. If you wanna talk about the discoloration for the audience, once again, that can be algae, that can be dirt, grime, debris. We live in Kentucky, so right? We have a lot of the distilleries, the warehouse, the soot that goes up in the air, just depends on what area of Kentucky you're in, but we get some accumulation of just ground, dirt, algae, debris on the shingles, um, and it gets a little bit darker, and then tree coverage, pollen, all the stuff that comes off the tree plays a vital role in that as well, but just to explain the removal of the oxidation, it's from the accumulation of dirt, ground, algae, and debris. Um, and then we look for the spider marks to see if that oxidation was removed by the, by the hailstone and what the frequency is. And then right back into some hail damage photos. Now, not, not every single hail strike is gonna look, you know, like the same perfect blemish over and over and over. This one looks a little bit different. Uh, I still circled it. I still felt like that was a hail strike. Now that comes from years of experience, touching, feeling, actually tasting the damage up close and personal as an inspector. So I was using my thumb, I was feeling of that spot. It was very soft, it felt bruised um, by a hailstone strike. So even though it may have not been, uh, you know, a clean fracture of the shingle, um, I know a lot of engineers that we've worked with in the past, they would definitely consider bruising to a shingle um, to be hail damage or possible hail damage. Usually we, we uh, uh, we leave it very open-ended for the adjusters. Obviously, the adjuster, the acting adjuster, has the ability to override our assessment, our information at any time. But if they agree with our assessment, with and most times they do, 99% of the time they do. They they know that we're on point. We know what we're looking at. They know we have you know training certifications to go along with our our assessments and our reports. Again, this one right here. I marked this as a blister that exposed fiberglass, unbroken plane. Um, I was feeling of that. It did not feel bruised. It was not a concave impression. This is just blistering that's been um, exacerbated by the overall age and weathering of the roofing system. Again, so for the audience too, I do got to touch in on this because keep in mind, I'm an adjuster. 
you know your photos don't always tell that we try to tell a story with the photos right but when you're looking at it from an adjuster standpoint i'm looking at still photos i'm like oh i don't know oh i don't know that's just keep in mind we're out there to correlate the information as you as an adjuster too if you've got some where you're like yeah that's a hell strike you're going to go with some of the stuff that might be more so blemishes, blemishes granule displacement but keep in mind the functionality aspect from an engineering standpoint is not the same from an insurance policy and adjusting standpoint it's something that gets thrown around the industry a lot your granule displacement exposes that asphalt binder mat you get moisture content UV rays over a repeated process, hot, hot, cold, hot, cold, dry, wet, dry, wet. It'll wear that area down like James was talking about earlier, where that fiberglass reinforcement mat becomes exposed and then water can traverse or, or go through, ingress in behind the materials, hit a nail and go into a cavity space. So you're in between stuff where we're looking at it from an adjuster standpoint, like, oh, I don't know, they don't really look like hell, that looks like blistering or that looks like a localized area of granule loss. Some of this stuff hangs on the edges of the value of what we go with and what we push forward from an adjuster standpoint, because, you know, right, we, we don't like the in-betweeners sometimes, but if they can correlate the information and an inspector can give us the opportunity to make the decision from an adjusting standpoint, if I'm the acting adjuster, that's what I'm looking for. Give me information, make it make sense, and help me make a decision. I don't need, I, I can do the determination. Right, absolutely. We'll go back to this photo right quick. You can actually see right here below the uh, below the blemish, you know, the, the obvious granule displacement. I can actually see some removal of oxidation directly below that. Um, didn't highlight the first time we were talking about that photo, but definitely something I was uh, soaking up, um, you know, as an inspector, as I was looking at this. This one right here, again, somebody can easily just call this uh, granule loss or call it blistering if they want or something like that but as an inspector I was on this roof I felt it I touched it I tasted it it did have a concave uh, impression there it did feel bruised so I was circling it up I'm obviously going to call that uh, possible wind damage at the exact moment I took that picture now understand this in my notes um, I'm indicating uh, shingle condition is this hail damage is this blistering I'm not I'm not doing that um, in real time as I'm taking the photos I'm waiting till my inspection is completed till I've gathered all the information until I've processed all this evidence all the information in my mind as an inspector um, before I put my notes in, finalize my report before I complete everything, send it over to an adjuster. I'm soaking up as much possible information as well. Uh, and, and we're going to touch on that more here in just a few minutes as we uh, as we progress through this report. Frequency here on the rear slope got a little bit better. Uh, within a 10 by 10 test area, I saw uh, the potential for eight uh, hail damage strikes on this slope. Now, again, some of these are not uh, not massive. Um, some of them do get much larger, as you can see there. Um, during a hail event, um, not every not every hailstone is exactly the same size. Now, before I go on to this next photo, um, and that's a that's a close up of this one right here. This is like what we refer to as holy grail hail damage, when you actually are able to uh, document a clean fracture through an asphalt composition shingle. The corner of this shingle just so happened to be unsealed where I could raise it slightly and take this photo. And then I went a step further to annotate this photo, obviously drawing attention to that little sliver of light coming through the shingle there. That was a clean fracture through that 30 year laminate shingle produced by a hailstone. This again, this is what we call holy grail hail. Sometimes, most of the time we're taking pictures just like this right here, what we can see on top of the shingle. The, the granule displacement, bruising, stuff like that, but we don't always get to document this right here. Uh, we don't want to take the risk of trying to break the cohesive seal of a shingle a lot of times. We don't want to do, you know, mat transfer. We don't want to damage the shingles in any way, shape, or form. So also for the audience, understand James has done thousands of inspections. Everybody knows <clears throat> if you get on a three-tap system, you're going to have more, more or less your racking line somewhere where they started that pattern and you've got the unsealed or alternating unsealed quarter laps. Same thing with your laminate shingles. James knows where to find that diagonal pattern of the unsealed corner laps. So without us physically breaking the cohesive seal where it's bonded, we know that there are some points in time where we've got a good fracture or good damage. And we know that that corner, because it follows that stair stepping pattern for the diagonal pattern of unsealed laps. And we can look at stuff like this without manipulating those shingles because as inspectors, 
That's the last thing that we want any of our team members doing, manipulating the material. And yeah, definitely don't want to take the risk of, you know, producing any type of damage to that roofing system. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we're just inspectors. We don't get to make the final determination. That's the responsibility strictly of the acting adjuster. So if we have potentially produced damage to a shingle and he decided to not buy the roof for one reason or another, that produces a liability for us as the inspection service company. So again, moving on, speeding up, um, frequency got a little a little bit better on the south facing slope as well. Again, let me let me go back to what I said earlier. Pitch on this roof played a huge factor in this. I think the overall uh, storm event, the hailstones were pretty much straight down. wasn't a very windward um, storm event. So most of these. Uh, most of these hailstones coming straight down. A lot of them didn't have enough kinetic energy to physically produce damage to these laminate shingles on a 10, 12 pitch roof. Um, so the frequency was not extreme on the shingles, but uh, as you're getting ready to see, we're gonna move on to some detached structures here in a minute. And that's really when I had my mind blown. Um, this particular property in my six years of doing ladder assisting, this is the most significant hail damage I've ever seen. In, in my professional career. So I wanna just speed up a little bit. We're, we're pretty much done with the main dwelling here, the shingled structure. Of course, I'm still providing good overviews of all the other slopes just to say, hey, I did not observe any wind damage on this property. And then we moved on to some detached structures. The rest of these detached structures were all metal uh, buildings. Again, the adjuster had specifically instructed me to focus on the roofing system. So I'm just taking overviews for my sketching purposes. And then I'm going straight into the roofing system, documenting the materials, just one layer, no drip edge, no felt on this metal roofing system. This was a 28 gauge steel panels and this particular roof had been seal coated as well. Very important for me to note that for the adjuster so he can potentially add uh, a line item in his estimate to account for the seal coating of this roofing system. Pitch again, that's for me, that's for uh, sketching purposes. Good quick overview of the roofing system. I'm noting the, again, the appurtenances. What, what else is on this roofing system other than the, uh, uh, other than the metal panels themselves? These are just uh, fiberglass uh, skylights and they definitely had some, some massive hail damage here. As Soon as I saw this clean fracture right here all the way through this fiberglass panel, I was pretty much concreting myself as calling this hail damage on this property. And as we go further and further, it got more significant, more significant. Every time I was turning my head and looking here, looking there, I was seeing big, big evidence of hail damage. Metal ridge cap here, that is a very significant strike more in the middle, metal uh, ridge cap, a hit there. And then damage count, uh, overview of my test area. This, this color of metal, of course, you can't see my, my chalk marks very well, but as soon as I started looking around, I started seeing very, very large impacts to this metal roofing system. Um, that's not the greatest photo. I know there's some hail damage in there, but it's kind of hard to pick off. That one right there. I circled that, circled that. These are probably golf ball size or better, 28 gauge steel panels, very sturdy material. It takes a very significant hail strike to cause damage to this. But nonetheless, it's collateral. And we're out there as inspectors to document. We don't know the policy, right? We, we don't have the, the whole policy that FNOL, the, the loss to go through and see that they have a collateral endorsement or that they don't. Our goal is to document the information. What's going on? What do we see? What is, what's the condition of the materials? And is there potential damage? So at this point right here, after I'd started seeing this caliber of hail damage on a 28 gauge metal panel, as soon as I finished up with this structure, I came down off of the roof, had a, had a very quick candid conversation with the adjuster, uh, again, to, uh, to work at his discretion and document things the way he wanted them for his claim file. And so we knew that we still had, uh, there was like there was like 10, maybe nine or 10 uh, detached structures on this property and we needed to speed up a little bit. So he said, all right, you think hail damage for sure? Absolutely, hands down, no doubts about it. He said, all right, let's speed up a little bit. So the, the following structures after this, 
He said, don't even worry about damage counts. We know the damage is going to be there. He said, hop on this roof, find it, snap me a couple of photos, overviews for your sketching, and, and let's let's speed it up a little bit. This is a, this is a spider mark. You see all this uh, algae, moss, lichen growth, whatever it is growing on this metal panel, and you clearly see where it's all been removed there. That's a good hit on that uh, individual striation. Yes, yeah. very, very large hit. That right there is potentially uh, tennis ball size or bigger. And man, I was seeing evidence everywhere to absolutely support calling hail damage. You see my scale there again, that, that spider, uh, that oxidation removal is in excess of two inches. I got to go back on them, James. Y'all remember the dwelling and some of those spots that you were seeing where you're, I know, because I'm an adjuster too, where you're like, ah, uh, the whole story. Remember, it's the whole story. Are we giving you information? And do you go through that information to understand the story over the property so you as an adjuster can make the best determination for that policy? Order? And once again, that's what, what we're out there for, to tell the complete story. So now that you guys are getting further into these detached structures and seeing some of the correlating information and damages to the panels, maybe it's starting to say, okay, hey, I'll, I'll go with you. Yeah, I, that might be hell on the, that dwelling on some of those iffy calls. So that's something that I wanted to highlight right there. It's big for us to tell the complete story. Absolutely, it is. Painting the picture. That that never stops. Painting the picture is a, is a mentality. It's a, a, a thought process. And as an inspector being stuck, again, smack in the middle between policyholders and adjusters that we're trying to service, you know, we have to be very, very on point with our documentation. So this right here, a break, a clean fracture in a 29-gauge metal panel. First time I've ever seen this in six years of performing inspections. That is the largest potentially the largest hail strike I've, I've ever, I've, that's the largest I've ever observed. On the, the striation of that metal panel right there, I mean, that's that's just a massive hailstone hit. And the information just keeps getting better and better. Um, there's hits all over this roof, oh, Matt, massive, yeah. massive spatter marks, removal of oxidation. And it all adds up to what I would feel like is an easy call for the adjuster. Once we- Can you go back to that one right there for the audience, right? Now, if that has an exposed fastener right there and it dents that metal at an angle where water, it no longer can perform the, the, the option or, or its function, right, of shedding water and water can now edge in between and ingress, intrude in between that nail, well, what is that? That's water coming into the property, into the building, on the farm equipment, so on and so forth. So once again, we look at this tidbit of information around fasteners, around fractures, and what is a fracture? A fracture is a break to material. That's what it is, where water can now ingress in behind that material. And, that, and uh, the, the break in that metal panel right here that we're seeing, even bigger than the first one I observed, that's probably the single largest hailstone hit I've ever seen in my career. Um, I'd say that's potentially baseball size to produce damage like that. And what do most justers do right here, James? What do we do as inspectors? What do we do as a collective community and industry together. If you go up there and that's the first thing you see, you might go, man, that's mechanical. That's a sharp object. Some went there. No, it's the whole story. It's the whole story. We're going to keep talking about the whole story. Painting the picture, always painting the picture. Again, if, if this had been a direct inspection situation where the adjuster wasn't present and they were three states away in an office building, my job as an inspector, incredibly important to paint the whole picture for the adjuster so that they can feel good, confident about making a determination to pay for this, uh, this damage on this property. And obviously we're on a time limit today um, for a, a little bit just to get this information to you guys, but understand one thing as well. We're big on our safety. We're big on knowing what we can do and what the property, because we, we talk about safety. It's our number one thing here, here at night is can we access these properties or is it safe? Is it safe from a ground to roof uh, transition? Is it safe from the ladder to roof transition? Because some of these detached structures, right? The spacing and the purlings, uh, the, the condition, you know, we're not going to get on anything that's unsafe but we know how to gather the information and we have the tools that's gonna to allow us to stay safe, like fall protection, like magnetic cooter calls, like drones. So we have a lot of stuff that we can still gather our information to tell you, the adjusters, what's going on. 
and the hits just keep on coming. Every one of these metal structures, every one of them had just the right amount of consistency, but also had that certain element of randomness that only a real storm can produce. Um, and that's very important to note. Another thing I wanted to touch on again, um, if the adjuster hadn't been present, obviously my report would be significantly more detailed in a few aspects. Each structure, I would have, uh, I would have provided very specific damage counts for each slope slash facet. Um, this particular adjuster, we have a very good relationship with uh, on a personal and professional level. He was directing me, obviously, during this inspection because of the amount of structures, the amount of time and energy. Also important to note this particular day, it was extremely hot. We were probably pushing 98 degrees. So obviously, we were trying to gather the information as quickly as we could and uh, get back to the uh, relative comfort of the AC in our vehicles. So he said, you know, get up on these structures, find the damage, give me some good photos, you know, at least a good handful of photos. You see this one right here. Again, that certain element of randomness, but also uh, consistency. Hill strikes all over these metal panels, spider marks uh, everywhere, definitely correlating that this was very fresh, recent hail activity at this property. And we'll speed up a little bit more. Again, every detached structure, overviews for my sketching purposes, uh, this, this particular structure did have a gutter, so I'm making sure I note the size of that gutter. One layer, no drip, no felt. Uh, this was back to 29 gauge rather than 28. And uh, let's see. Massive spider marks there. Again, all over the place. Heavy, heavy oxidation being removed from these hailstones big damage all over these metal panels. That's a big, big hit. That's golf ball to eh, potentially close to tennis ball again. We still get that eave shot to uh, document the, the uh, you know, the width, the thickness of the metal, uh, but also if there's any eave stop, bird stops, foam inserts, we go up to the ridge cap. Uh, are there any foam inserts for the ridge cap as, as well? the rake edge metal, we want to document that information because it's not all about the architecture, but it's us producing the information for the materials so an adjuster can write that estimate because we are always out there for the direction of that adjuster to gather the information. But when we're out there on site and we're collaborating with, with an adjuster, we are, we're talking through this, we're getting the information, we're giving him the materials, what's going on, what else is needed. Uh, so I just wanted to tell the audience that, you know, some of the things that we're not talking about, uh, we are still doing because we're in collaboration with that adjuster the entire time to get him the information to write that estimate later on. This particular structure, this one had been seal coated as well. I did, uh, I did make note of that in my report. Again, that's a potential uh, or should be uh, an extra line item on that adjuster's estimate that he can account for. And again, at this point, we're, we're kind of speeding through this at the at strictly at the discretion of the adjuster. Now this, uh, this structure right here, um, this gets into some very, very, very heavy gauge metal. This is the kind of material right here that you could literally take a sledgehammer to and it would be difficult to actually produce That's damage on. Bunker is gonna look like right there. Yeah, it's pretty much a storm bunker. Very significant material. Did not observe any damage on this because of the particular layout um, design of this structure. Didn't actually climb it. I, I offered to, but the adjuster, again, because of the material, he said, ah, don't worry about it. You know, I can pretty much see exactly what you're seeing and we're not seeing any damage on it. So we're just going to move along. Do you have the sketch on, on the report? I know we're getting I close. I do have sketches on all the structures that we observed damage on. This grain bin silo, um, I did actually have a, a, a spot right here where I could actually get my metal yeah. gauge on this. 22 gauge, uh, very, very significant material. Again, you could pretty much take a, uh, you could pretty much take a sledgehammer to this and, and maybe not produce any damage at all. Did climb it, did provide a few photos here for continuity to the adjuster, obviously saying that I didn't observe any damage on this structure so that he could have that to back him up when he goes to speak with the, the policyholder, the homeowner saying, hey, we did not observe any damage on that structure. And sometimes there's a snow and ice guards that you guys see. Get into the sketch. 
Oh, every structure that I observed potential damage on produce a sketch for each one of those structures. This is the main dwelling. And of course I'm illustrating uh, where, my, uh, where my test areas were produced on that roofing system. Uh, for the viewing pleasure of the adjuster for continuity so he knows exactly where potential damage was observed there and then the metal structures um, again we were kind of speeding up at the discretion of the adjuster so i didn't illustrate every single sketch but did provide good accurate measurements for each structure that we observed damage on and this is all a part of the night solutions way this is what we do for adjusters this is the type of information we provide to them regularly so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Uh, pretty much that's the gist of the report that we wanted to share with everybody. Julie, David, do you guys want to take back over? Hey. All right. We do have a question for you. Hold on. Let me see it because my screen jumped. Oh, here it comes. It's a two-part question. What's your opinion on the underside seals on fiber shingles once pulled loose? And then would you consider them damaged or will they reset over time with warm weather? So let's state this. So if you're dealing with older materials, anything I talk about right for the 90s, early 2000s on up, once you got to that 2010 mark, the engineering uh, or the engineers and the uh, material specialists at the GAF, Owens Corning, at these manufacturers, they really started working on that cohesive seal. How, bond, how good was that bond? And it, is it making the requirements when it goes through testing? You know, like a lot of these products before they're released to the consumers, um, uh, like ASTM and stuff, will do product testing. But if you tear that shingle up, right, if that shingle's pulled up and you have significant mat transfer to the point where that that sealant strip line is gouged it is hard to reseal that shingle it's just very very difficult to reseal that shingle but you're not just looking at that you're looking at delamination of that material when you're pulling it up is it tearing is it hard to break along that stagnation region are you you frailing and damaging that stagnation region as you're breaking that course of seal so it's a multi-part uh, question. It just depends on the condition of that material once that sealant strip is broken. Okay. Um, I had another question. Where do you guys operate? Like, are you all over the country or are you specifically in Kentucky? I know that's where your home base is. Yeah, based out of uh, central Kentucky. We're not yet nationwide, uh, but we're going that direction uh, very quickly. We are growing rapidly over the past year or two. Uh, right now, I think we uh, currently operate. Uh, regular daily claims uh, inspections in about 16 states. Um, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna pull up our coverage map here in just a second. We also, also uh, offer um, CAT uh, servicing for an additional six, seven states, uh, mostly through the, uh, the south, southeastern, uh, kind of middle portions of the country, Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Alabama, Indiana, Illinois, uh, we're into Texas, we're into Florida. There's our coverage map right there. Uh, go back. Back to screen share right quick. And there's our current coverage map right there. Okay. All right. I think that and that's, uh, and like I said, that's been growing rapidly. Uh, just a few years ago, we were in what, Kentucky, Ohio, Southern Indiana, Tennessee. Um, you see, obviously, uh, our work is uh, being valued. Um, the adjusters very much like our product, like our knowledge, our uh, our uh, experience level in the industry, and uh, they come knocking at our door every day. So our, our coverage has definitely grown and we're definitely looking to, to take on new adjusters anytime. Uh, as a sales and marketing director, please reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to start a conversation with any prospective client. We're big on our relationships. It's not that you just get somebody you throw a claim to. We, we wanna know how the adjusters need their documentation because they, they are the ones making the decision for the policy holder. And we're big on documenting um, in, in that direction. We do have our process, but that's, that's important. Right. Okay. Um, now, David, I'm not sure if this question is directed more toward CNC or toward Knights, but metal roofs are not measured by hail hits, but by the square footage where, where we would get uh, from Eagle View, correct? I'm not... 
So the person that asked me that, if you can elaborate on that for for me, I would appreciate it. And Could you read that David, one more time? Could you read that one more time, Jerry? Says metal roofs are not measured by hail hits, but by the square footage where we would get from Eagle, eagle view, correct? Maybe, maybe in an estimate writing sense. I mean, they're obviously worried about the square footage. Um, this particular case, that, that report that we reviewed today, again, very important to note, I was operating strictly at the discretion of the adjuster on site during that inspection. So once we saw uh, what we absolutely felt was hail damage to a couple of structures, we were kind of just speeding through the process. It was a very hot day. There was a lot of inspection to be done there. So I was strictly following his discretion. And right. he, you know, he may have allowed that strictly just because we have a very good relationship with him. He's very comfortable with our our documentation okay and um lynn if for some reason that didn't answer your question feel free to email me later and i will try to get you the answer you're looking for but i think david has some questions hey julie yeah uh first of all uh ron and james thank you for for presenting this information at you know in the industry um you know, hail damage and what, what is and what isn't, that's, that just seems to be um, an opportunity across the board for everybody. Um, so I know this was, for me, it was great um, to see you guys go through it and explain it. I did make some comments, a couple of questions. You answered a couple of those questions, but, you know, Ryan and James, both of you said the whole story, painting the picture. And I mean, and that's true. You know, when you're saying, ah, you're looking at, I don't know, is it this? Yeah, I don't know. Well, it goes back to the, your collateral damage. You know, is there anything to support it? You know, if you're on the fence about it, what, where else can I make a, a case for it besides this? Um, some of the uh, photos you showed, James, you had bird droppings on it. Um, you say, why do you have, why did you take a picture of that? Well, I mean, it's on the roof. And surprisingly, some adjusters say that's hail damage. And it's, it's, it's not it. I don't know if it's a lack of knowledge or just a, um, you know, a lack of not wanting to or just trying to, to get things paid for and not doing, not knowing. I don't know. But you've got hail damage. You've got algae on the roof. That's mistaken for hail damage. So, again, it goes back to, to knowing and looking at the collateral uh, situation. Now, that was, you may have mentioned this. What was that on the, the picture that you took? Was that a lightning rod system or a solar um, yes. Panel. Yes. There, there was a, uh, there was a lightning rod system on that roof. So yeah. if the adjuster, you know, happened to buy that entire roofing system, very important for him to know that for detaching reset purposes, that's something he can include in his estimate. That's right. Cause that's going to be in the way, right? Um, not all hail damage is going to be perfect in the middle of the shingle, right? It's going to be sporadic. I like the way you took the picture of you use the actual shingle gauge to take a, give an idea of how big the indention was, the hit was, uh, you know, some folks use their tape measure, whatever, but you know, your shingle gauge, of course, you want to make sure when you're doing the, you're documenting the shingle that you're using the right shot, the right side of the gauge, which you did, but we, sometimes we see, you know, a, a, a laminate side on the three tab shingle and then <laughs> right. make sure you're paying attention to what you're, to what you're doing. So um, Ron, you mentioned the, the age of the roof. It always comes up. And we see sometimes in documentation to where, you know, we, we pull permits, no recent permits. So the, the roof has got to be default to the age of the home. And, and that's not necessarily true all the time. But I like that explanation as to how you um, explain that. So I, I think that was a, a good takeaway as well. Yeah. And that's in 1 16th, 2 16th, 3 16th, 4 16th of an inch. Once you get to the wear of about 4 16th and above, that's generally indicative of a 20 year plus system, because once again, that's where water, um, you know, it's where weathering and water is moving over that, that change in geometry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's valuable information. Um, the, one of the other things you answered it kind of sort of, but you said, does the adjuster guide you? And I know that the adjuster guides you, but you did mention that they ultimately have, the option to override your assessment if they don't agree with it. Now, naturally, you know, that's that's not going to happen. But, um, you know, they do pretty much tell you, ask you guys what they need, tell you what they need and ask you to to provide that evidence. So um, one other thing that uh, bunker that you guys are going to build for yourselves, yeah. uh, you said you were going to you offered to climb on it. Okay. Um, what if uh, what if you could get on it? Do you all are you all allowed to use drones? I know that 
ultimately goes back to the carrier. But I mean, do you use drones? Do you? We do. Uh, we use that that Mavic Mini. Uh, obviously, it's not really a part of you know a part of our inspection uh, process. We've got a few guys that's got the Part 107. It's up. It's not. It's not us billing for that Mavic Mini. We're billing for our inspection. But sometimes we have dangerous buildings and stuff that we will just gather some quick documentation on. And there's times we'll take that drone and shoot it up in the sky if we don't have good aerial imagery. Uh, you know, sometimes it says that the eagle views can't be produced. We can shoot down at 400 feet and we can now upload that image and sketch and give that adjuster, um, you know, basically il illustrations and, and square footage for each structure. Right, right. That's, just that's to, awesome. Just, just to elaborate on that a little bit more. Yes, we, we do utilize mm -hmm. drones from time to time. Uh, but we try to stay boots on the ground or rather boots on the roof as much as we possibly can. Um, all yeah. of our technicians, uh, you know, they're, they're trained, certified. They know how to use fall protection, cougar paws. They know what's traversable. They know what their, their limits are. Um, drones are awesome. They can take really good photos. I mean, you can buy 4K uh, cameras on drones. And they take really awesome uh, photos. They got these uh, sensors in them. You know, you can only get so close. You're usually taking a picture from three, four, maybe five foot range. Um, and sometimes you really need to be closer than that. Um, that's where boots on the roof is, is most important, specifically around hail damage. Um, like right. that one photo in my report where I was showing you the Holy Grail hail, the actual fracture that was viewable from the underside of that laminate shingle. That's something that a drone absolutely can't do. And that is, uh, that is great, great evidence to present to an adjuster, paint the picture very well and say, yes, absolutely. Without a doubt, I believe this is hail damage. A drone just can't yeah. do that. That's right. That's right. Uh, one last thing. Uh, probably doesn't happen all the time, but I know it comes up every once in a while. Uh, Ryan, I know you're an adjuster, um, but, you know, do you ever come across or, or what if, you know, you're the policy holders out there and say, well, you're not an adjuster. You're not licensed adjuster. Uh, you get the support from the adjuster out there that you're, you know, again, you're just there to gather the evidence and, and you're certified, you're trained, uh, but the adjuster is going to ultimately make that decision as far as coverage. Right. And so if somebody's really hounded me on that, um, you know, I still don't really talk about my license because my license is only relevant if I'm assigned as the acting adjuster to work that file, just like a public adjuster. It's not a public adjuster until you sign that contract with that insurer. So we're not really, you know, through the Department of Insurance, we're, we can't really talk coverage stuff, policy stuff, and act in that capacity if we're not assigned in that capacity. So I just tell the policyholder, I'm here to gather information. Um, I'll be super thorough and, and make sure that we document everything that your contractor has. And just we make sure that we're collaborating with the contractor and we're, we're in agreement with the evidence that's being produced. It's going to go to the adjuster and make the decision. And usually the insurers and the contractors um, are, are good with that. And they know we are very thorough. So they really like when they see the Knights team out there. Right, right. It definitely for that particular type of uh, example that you shown, that was a large piece of property. So I know that took all day. Uh, that's that's that was great. Really great information for me. I appreciate that. Uh, that's 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 all I've got, Julie. If um, if we have any all other right, questions, well, I don't you may want see to check. any more questions in the box. Mm -hmm. So it looks like um, that's it. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really, yes. really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone who logged in to watch and make sure you are tuned in in two weeks. I believe it will be commercial claims discussion. And, um, but that information will come out later and we will see you in a couple weeks. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye everybody. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you.